contrary to the law. You know, there's a little difference in being contrary to the law and trespassing against the law. Contrary to the law is usually what teachers do, people that actually bring up a different sign, a different slogan, a different teaching or doctrine that turns away from the Word of God and go contrary to the doctrine of Jesus Christ. We see a lot of this today. That's why I chose this particular subject, is you've got to be very careful because it, where you would least expect it, it started out in the pulpits and it'll be ended in the pulpits. You want to always remember how Satan tempted Christ. It wasn't that he tried to talk him into going down to a sin parlor somewhere. No, he taught Bible to him, quoted scripture. And that's what you have to be wise enough yourself to know God's word well enough that you know if somebody's going contrary to it. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the 74th Psalm. The 74th Psalm, we're going to start out in the Old Testament. It was happening back then. This particular psalm is called Mizkal of Asap, which is being interpreted to say instructions from the collector of the people. He that's supposed to call the people together and to instruct them against what? Things that go contrary to our Father's teachings. And you must be sharp enough to identify and nail it. You've got to recognize it when it happens, okay? So, Psalms 74, a word of wisdom from our Father, verse 1, and it reads, O God, why hast thou cast us off forever? Why doth thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture, those that you've gathered? Uh, now, you know, that's not, tr that's not the case. Our Father is not angry at the sheep of his pasture, but Satan will certainly mislead them. You see, where does this word pasture come from? Pastor. You're supposed to have a decent pastor that takes care of the pasture. That is to say, feeds what's edible, feeds what can be digested, feeds what will save your soul and carry you all the way through. Okay. Verse 2, remember thy congregation which thou hast purchased of old. God did. He set it in motion, the Savior, the rod of thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed, this Mount Zion wherein thou hast dwelt. In other words, Mount Zion is his favorite place. And this is kind of personal, and thou, is, thou and they are very emphatic in this chapter, speaking to our Father. And naturally, our Father is in control. But if you allow someone to mislead you, guess what? He's going to let them. He's going to let you make the choice because you're responsible for your own self. You know, we have teachings in this generation where people... You don't have to be responsible for yourself. We're in the age of grace. You can do whatever you want to and repent, and, and uh, Christ paid the price. You know, isn't that sloppy? That is really, you know, to use God as Christ on the cross as an excuse to sin is a, it's despicable. Just is, it won't fly. So you are responsible for your own actions, for your own decisions, and you may listen to this person, you may listen to this person. Always go to God's Word to find out whether the person is telling the truth and whether it's contrary to God's law. Verse 3, lift up thy feet unto the perpetual desolations. In other words, that, please don't stand still, march against this. Even all that the enemy hath done wickedly in the sanctuary. And this is the gathering place. In other words, where was the enemy wicked down at a sin bar? No, in the sanctuary, in the church, in the gathering place. That's where false teachings come into being. That's where traditions of men go contrary to the Word of God. 
And the reason I brought you to Psalm 74 is not a new thing. Satan has tried this coming out the gate, okay? And he will not uh, cease, okay? And here's why we came here, this particular verse, meaning it's absolutely contrary to Father's teachings. Verse 4, Thine enemies roar in the midst of the con thy congregations. They set up their ensigns for signs. They give you false teaching. They set up false traps. They will even go as far as saying, you don't have to understand God's word. Why? You're going to fly away. If ever there was a teaching that cannot be documented in God's word, if a person has any intelligence at all of the scriptures, that cannot be documented. It's contrary to the teachings of Jesus Christ. It is contrary to the Word of God. What he's saying here, the enemy absolutely comes into the church, into the congregation, and sets up signs and signals. You know something? There will always be some that will grab it and run with it. Don't do that. God sent you this letter. And it is for your edification to rightly divide it and to know and to understand. So do not let him work into your family. That particular verse is why we came here, because in the Hebrew it doesn't declare it, but in the Greek manuscripts, the Septuagint, the word I'm contrary is listed right here. Okay, Verse 5, A man was famous according as he had lifted up axes upon the thick trees. In other words, the lumberjacks were famous because they could cut stuff. They could really make wood. They could make lumber. Okay. But what are they doing now right in the church? Six. But now they break down the carved work thereof at once with axes and hammers. They destroy God's work if you let them. I, I want to repeat that. If you let them, no one can destroy your salvation. No one can destroy your soul. It's yours to do with as you choose. But they'll try. And they'll use hammers if it's necessary. They'll take an axe to it. They will destroy your church if you allow it. That's why you want to always be a family that protects each other, that, that uh, dispels false teachings, that has nothing to do with it. That if a false sign comes along, stomp on it. You don't even have to be all that nice about it. Paul wasn't, and I'll document it before this lecture is over. By nice, I mean righteous indignation by the enemy is not considered nice. Okay, To one of God's faithful, it's very nice. Very nice. To put your foot down, that's it. You, know, you do not mess with God's sheep. Don't try to mislead them. Protect them, teach them, help them. But God help you if you ever try to mislead them in a true pastor's book, okay? Keep your axe out of the house of God. Keep a hammer to build with, but not an axe or a hammer to destroy. Verse 7, they have cast fire into thy sanctuary. They have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. That's Jerusalem itself. It's been run over, run down. Everything under the sun happened there. Everything worshipped there. God's favorite place in the world. You remember what happened to, to Aaron's two sons that took strange fire into the sanctuary? God killed them. Bang! Just like that. He won't put up with it. So even though this, and, and bear in mind, again, maskil in the Hebrew tongue, this is instructions. It's instructions to you that you're not deceived, that you protect the sanctuary. Verse 8, they said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. Let's root them out. They have burned up all the synagogues of God in the land. Uh, before the captivity, there weren't synagogues. There was gathering places, okay? But churches, they've destroyed them. 
And they will if you let them. Beloved, let me tell you something. In all the places that God's Word is supposed to be taught, warning people of the end to come, I mean, we have, I'll say it right here in this little town, and I'm not going to judge any of them, I think it's 17 churches. And I wonder how many teach the Antichrist is coming first. I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to judge them, I'm not going to play guessing games. I only know of one out of 17. So you go from there. Verse 9. We see not our signs. There is no more any prophet, neither is there among us any that knoweth how long. Um, there is no true. We've got lots of prophets. You, they'll say they are, okay? But they're false prophets. And you want to be careful of them. John the Baptist was the last true prophet. There will be other prophets when the Antichrist appears, both from sons and daughters. But until then, the Holy Spirit will not speak that tongue that was spoken of by Joel the prophet. Okay. God leads his people daily. Verse 10. O God, how long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? Uh, and, and so it is. You know, when pulpits spew vimen uh, against the real truth of God's Word, it's painful. It's painful to our Father. And, and uh, hey, I'm, like I said, I'm not judging anybody, and it's not our place to judge. But it is your responsibility to do what's right. Okay. Um, verse 11, Why withdrawest thou thy hand? As I said, there's a lot of thys and uh, thou and thys in this, which makes it emphatic, especially from the 13th verse to the end. It's talking to our Father. Thy hand, even thy right hand, that's power, pluck it out of thy bosom. In other words, usually a man at that time would put his hand in his bosom when he was at rest. Don't be at rest, Father. Get busy. Do something about it. That's a little bold to talk to the Father that way, but, um, but uh, the, instruction, the instructor did that. Verse 12, For God is my King of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. He works deliverance. And I'm going to tell you something. There is no other deliverance. He's it. There's no other way. I know some people claim there is, but ultimately when it comes right down to that judgment seat, there's only one that sits on it. I don't care who you are, where you came from, or where you're going. That's the place. Okay. And that's, there's only one deliverer. It's, it's, uh, naturally, it pays dividends to be in good standing with him, to be a servant of his. Verse 13, here we go. Thou didst... Divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragon in the waters. Father, we know you can do it. We know you parted that Red Sea and let our people cross. And we know that you know how to take care of Satan and, his, and the children, Pharaoh's boys that came after us. 14, thou breakest the heads of the Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. You fed the the scavengers with him. I mean, the waters closed back over, Pharaoh's army's gone. Thou didst cleave the fountain at the flood. Thou didst, thou driedest up mighty rivers. He, you can do it. In other words, Father, we know you can handle this. Got no doubt. The day is thine. The night is also, is also is thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. He has. You know, when, you, when we, He gave us this, it's yours to enjoy. Okay. Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. Thou hast made summer and winter. And we will always have summer and we will always have winter. Don't ever get caught up in global warming, okay? If anything, it's kicked in reverse and God's showing it's going the other way. 
God's kind of talking to people if they're listening, okay? 18, remember this, that the enemy hath reproached, O Lord, he scoffed at, okay? And that the foolish people have blasphemed thy name. They love it. They eat it up. They call it worship and they call it religion. 19, O oh, deliver not the soul, this is Nephesh, your very soul, of thy turtle dove upon the multitude of the wicked. Forget not the congregation of thy poor forever. That word turtle dove is a word of tenderness. Father, don't forget about us. We love you is what it's saying. Okay. The coo of a turtle dove brings that warmth and that compassion into this. Father, don't forget us. You don't have to worry. He won't. Okay. Never have to worry. God never forgets us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. But again, this is a, this is a psalm of instruction that you don't get misled, that you protect yourself. For they're going to bring signs, if it's possible, right into the church, right into the congregation. And unfortunately, in some congregations, when we come closer to that time of the false messiah, they're going to allow it. They're going to have revivals. Unfortunately, you know for who? Right in Christian churches. Boy, that's a bummer. What a bummer. What a time to live, and you're living in it. What a chance to serve God. What a chance to be a champion of your people to have a destiny, and to know the truth. Don't be deceived. Verse 20, have respect unto the covenant. Remember our, the covenant you made, our marriage, for the dark places of the earth are full of the inhabitants of cruelty. Deception and vice is rampant out there. Beloved, it gets worse every day. You can see it every day. Children killing children. For no reason, 20 bucks. A little bit of money. You take a life and think nothing of. Snuff it out. Talk about cruelty, wickedness. Just obey your father, stay with him, and of all times use wisdom. Don't be caught in a place where you're not in charge, okay, where you're not in control. 21. Oh, let not the oppressed return to shame. Let the poor and needy praise thy name. In other words, let them have cause to praise thy name, and we do. We can praise his name day and night because he provided a Savior. And he sent us a letter giving us wisdom and truth and guidance, whereby we have that proper direction, whereby we're not, I promise you, we're not going to be ashamed. And God is certainly not going to be ashamed of us. But so ever proud of you. We're standing that line. 22, arise, O God, and plead thine own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproacheth thee daily. They just scoff at you over and over. They make light. They try to do away with God's name out of everything. Do something about it, Father. Well, we're doing something about it. That's why he has you. He expects us to hold the line. We're not a bunch of wimps, and we're not a bunch of poor me babies. We know how to take care of business. You know how to control your own life and family, and you know how to be responsible for your own actions. Do it. Okay. Can-do type people, with God's help, of course. Verse 22, 3. Forget not the voice of thine enemies, the tumult of those that rise up against thee increaseth continually, and it will continue. Don't, don't, even, don't ever get disparaged. Don't ever despair, brother, okay? Be of good courage. It's going to get worse, friend, and we can cut it. We can handle it. Do you know what? In a sense, that's good news because that means we're coming down to the end. It is not worse for you. It is worse for the misled because they're going to be deceived. They're set up. They are set up big time. And remember what God said in in um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, hey, 
If you want to believe a lie about Satan not coming, don't worry. I'll help you believe it. I'll send you delusion like you've never seen before. So the signs are in the chapel, in the congregations. And many people are going with it. Not you. Don't ever dare. Follow your father. He will always, he will never leave you nor forsake you. You don't have to call and ask him to come. He's already here. He's with you. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. Why? Because he loves you. And you're one of his children. Okay, let's, let's go to the book of Acts, if we may. Paul has been taken prisoner, and they were binding him up and about ready to work him over and beat him, and he says to this centurion, this, this Roman, he said, I, this was in the prior chapter to where we're going, I'm just setting the stage for you. He said, hey, is it proper that you can beat a Roman citizen without him being tried? And the, Syrian, the, the centurion said, whoa in other words, you do not touch a Roman citizen, especially one natural born without an order from Caesar. Okay. And they're already, I mean, they've, they've manhandled Paul. And there's some people sweating big time. Okay. And Paul picks this up at that time. I mean, the religionists want him done away with. And the Romans said, hey, uh, we'll just end this right here and all of you show up down on the porch. That's the judgment place. We pick that up with chapter 23, verse 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, that means his old eyes cut right into them, okay? He earnestly watched them. This is Acts chapter 23, okay? Acts chapter 23. His eyes were fixed on them. They were burning right into them. And he said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. In other words, my, my conscience is clear. Remember what had happened. God picked him personally on the road to Damascus and said in Acts chapter 9, This is my chosen vessel in verse 16. So uh, Paul was in good standing with Father. Verse 2, we got, uh, we got the high priest here. You know who the high priest is? It's old Ananias. But who do you think appointed him high priest? Do you think it was the church? Do you think it was God? No, it wasn't. It wasn't at all. Uh, he was appointed by Herod. Okay. He was not a man of God, even though he was called a high priest. This is what he said, verse 2. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Verse 3. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And here you have it, contrary to the law. It's not God's law that he should be smitten, but a big mouth. Okay. So you have to learn to stand your ground. And you have to know the law well enough that you can stand your ground. You have to know ordinances, you have to know the law, and you have to know statutes. That is to say, basically the makeup. For example, rituals and statutes of blood ordinances have done away with. Why? Christ, they were nailed to the cross with Christ and we're under His blood, not some bull's blood. Okay? We may have a lot of bull around but, um, that would have you believe otherwise, but not so. Okay? So he stands his ground and he said, uh, because, why? Because he knows he's not a high priest, he's a fake, a phony. Okay? Verse 3, then, then, okay, we got uh, 3, verse, 
contrary to the law. In other words, your orders um, certainly make void the true law. Verse 4, And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Are you going to talk about our high priest that way? Do you think that shook Paul up? Do you think it made Paul worry? Forget it. Okay. Paul still knew he was a fake. Okay. What did Paul say? Verse 5. Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. In other words, um, uh, Herod appointed this man, not God. Otherwise, Paul would have respected him. Paul had no respect for him because he wasn't for the people and had no idea what a high priest should even perform. Then said Paul, oh, I'm sorry, verse 6, And when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees, always use your head, okay? When, when you're taken into something, know the law well enough. You know that Sadducees don't, they, I mean, you live today and when you die, that's it. And the Pharisees believe in life after death. So we have two factions here. So to turn the attention from himself, Paul is going to get them fighting each other. Okay, And then he's going to escape. He's going to get away from there. Okay, That's using your old head. All right. But, uh, when, but when Paul perceived that the one part was Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. And he was. A Roman. Okay. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. There he lays it out, see. Uh, in other words... As a Pharisee, I believe in life after death, and it's because I believe in that that they're after me. Now, again, many of you might say, do you mean Paul was a Roman? He was a Roman citizen, like you're a citizen of, of America. Okay. His genealogy was that he was of the tribe of Benjamin okay. uh, and, um, and of the house of Israel, Romans chapter 11, as well as many other places documenting. But he was a Pharisee, raised a Pharisee, and a strong Pharisee. They knew him well, okay? Um, and um, verse um, 7, And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided, okay? You got a bunch of crackpots here that really don't stand for anything, but we've got on their toes now for what Little they do know. A little wisdom can be a great dangerous thing to some people, okay? For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry of the scribes, that, that, that would be your leaders, that were of the Pharisees, part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit of an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now, you see how Paul has worked this? He took a situation where a government was about to beat him, in which he was a citizen, and he had them really apologizing before it was over with, and then he outdid even the religious community by being familiar, not with what is contrary to the law, but the law. And not only his law, but the law of the other people, whereby he could utilize it on them. So always be careful when you know someone is going contrary to God's Word. That's trouble. That's trouble with a capital T. Okay? Let's go to verse 10. And when they arose a great dissension, the chief captain fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. Guess what happened then? Listen carefully. If you have a red letter edition, the following verse mainly is in red. And the, and the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, 
Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. You know, 40 people made a, went under a curse here this night and said, we're not going to eat nor drink until we kill Paul. Paul. Christ has just said, you're going to Rome. Now, I mean, they're, they're in a heap of hurt because if the Lord Jesus Christ said you're going someplace, you're going. Okay. So they're not going to kill Paul. So they're going to have a long, hard, dry spell, okay? And Paul's going to walk right away. Why? He doesn't go contrary to the law. And I mean, he stood face to face with that chief priest and called him what he was. Righteous indignation is okay. It is all right. Now, there was a time even that uh, Christ himself was exposed to to um, a, something that was con go with me to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew, the first gospel of the New Testament. Isn't that brilliant? And in chapter 15. Excuse me. Another reason you should be familiar with law, okay, with word, with God's word. Chapter 15, verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do the disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? They're breaking the law. For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Now, they... They washed, but the Pharisees had a baptism they went through. I mean, you threw a little here, and you threw a little there, and threw a little over there, and you, you went through the ritual, okay? But is it biblical? No. They just told you it's the tradition of the elders, not God, okay? How, how is Jesus going to handle this, okay? Uh, verse 3, But he answered and said unto them, why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? It's important, beloved. Why do you break God's law by your elders' traditions? That doesn't make it so, friend, and you've got to learn the difference. You've got to know the difference. You can't be deceived. Okay. Verse 4, For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and... He that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. In other words, Exodus chapter 20 is just not so, okay, 21 rather, not so. You have to honor. You know, they may even be mean to you, but you still honor. That's why you're here, okay? You can honor them for that, okay? You can even set them aside and still you owe your being to them, you know. Verse 5, but you say... Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. In other words, you scribes and you Pharisees and you Sadducees, you tell a person, if you declare Corbin in the Greek tongue, gift, if you say it's for the church, let them starve. You don't have to take care of mommy and daddy if you're giving it to the church. Just bring all your money to the church and let mama and daddy die. Okay. Now, this is what Jesus is saying here, okay? That's pretty strong. But he's getting the message across real good, okay? Um, I have a work title, Corbett, and you might like to hear it sometime, okay? which is a Greek word meaning it's given to the church. Let everybody else do without. Okay. Verse 6, And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free? Question there, like. Thus have you made the commandment of God of non-effect by your tradition. 
You just wiped it out. You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, the, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, or that that is contrary to the law. Now in closing, Jesus made it very important what Isaiah said. And we kind of just um, finished that teaching in in Isaiah 29, verse 13, Isaiah 29, 13. This is why Jesus drew attention to this. Verse 13 of Isaiah 29 reads, and remember, Isaiah in the Hebrew tongue means Yahweh's salvation. Isaiah. If you take your Bible and break it right in the middle, you'll be in the book of Isaiah. Okay, And uh, verse 29, 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth. In other words, they talk a mean battle for God. And with their lips do honor me. But have removed their heart far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Contrary to the law. Precept on precept by men, not precept on precept by Almighty God. That's how you study God's Word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, whereby it is God that speaks, not some yo-yo, okay? not some man. Because I, I, I don't know if you know it or not, there is no man as wise as our Father is. Okay. Verse 14, Therefore, behold... I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people. Listen to me. Even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish. And the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. And then you can understand back in chapter 3 why he said your rulers you elect in the end days will be children's minds. Act like a bunch of kids squabbling about this and squabbling about that and instead of what's good for the people, what's good for the gathering, the congregation. He said, I I'm going to work it. He said, you're not going to have any wisdom there. They're going to pull away from God. And so it is. It, um, you know, the strange things happen to people that pull away from God. One of the most popular atheists that ever lived and unfortunately, she carried the name Murray at one time, bless her heart. She ended up in a barrel. Okay. Atheists are not protected by God. Okay. So it doesn't pay to go against God's word or contrary to the commandments of God. Okay. God always evens it. Wisdom departs. Let it be said, it is written, and so it is. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us? And who knoweth us? Or have you ever heard someone say, It's the same as it's always been. It's never going to happen. Nothing ever changes. And they're blind because, man, if you look around you, what is new since the year of our Lord, 1948? We've got a new nation a nation that was promised to be the generation of the fig tree, Israel. Okay. Wasn't a nation for almost uh, 2,000 years. And boy, there she sits, just like God said it would. And they say, it's not going to happen. It is happening every day. If you have wisdom, if you have your eyes open, if you don't listen to people that go contrary to the law, which is to say God's word. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say to him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he hath no understanding? You know, there, there are people that do that. 
God isn't real because I can't see him. I had a question from a, a person last week. Said, I'm in love with an 80-year-old woman and she doesn't believe in God because she can't see him. You know? There are people like that. But he's there and he's real and he's in control. And he is the potter. And he wants to shape you. But if you ever let the clay, which is the flesh of your body, so harden that it can't be, that God can't work with it, like clay, then you're in bad shape. Because he's going to keep working it. And do you know what happens to clay when it hardens and you keep working it? It shatters. Okay. And there's shattered lives it is if you allow it. So always be open to your Father and never go, anytime you hear somebody go contrary to his word, and when you've studied God's word to the point that you have the basic working knowledge, you don't have to remember every chapter and every verse, but you just have the general trend, the events as they're going to go down, then you, God intuitively, that means um, without um, knowing, you're going to know. Without knowing how it even come to your mind, you're going to know. That's false. That is wrong. When you have that working knowledge of God's law, that's His Word. Always stick with it. And you'll always be blessed of Him. Like I said, the 74th Psalm, which was a psalm of instruction, teaching you how to be careful how to watch, how to be on guard. Uh, God's always with us. He's always there. But you've got to do your part. As it is written in that same book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 26, what did he say? Hey, remind me of my promises I made to you. And let's talk about it. Now, if you don't know what promises God has made, you're in a heap of hurt, aren't you? Because you wouldn't know what to talk about to him. He, he wants your attention. He wants you to listen to him. And, and he wants you also to say, hey, Father, you promised me knowledge if I would love you, and I really do love you, and I want more knowledge. Get ready. It's going to come. It's going to happen. Isaiah 43, 26 is real. And I, for one, can guarantee you that it is. So... Our Father loves His children. Always return that love and stay in His Word. That is His law. Do never, never, never go contrary to it. Heavenly Father, thank You, Father, for Your letter. Thank You for Your advice. Thank You for Your guidance, Father. We thank You for being with us. We ask the, that continuance in the name of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Amen, amen, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Saturday sundown is three days and sometime after sundown on Saturday night, he resurrected in after that hour, which put it into our Sunday. Okay? That's uh, how it happened. I, I know that some people that are ignorant of the very time of that time would might tell you that, he, that it was Friday, but it wasn't. Okay? He was crucified on Wednesday. It was Passover. It was a high Sabbath. Uh, Maggie from um, Oregon. 
my dad was a pastor who, who, um, who taught very much that what you do, barring an eighth day creation. He met you in Missouri. His name was Corky Smith. I don't remember that. And he had one arm. I recently read something in Leviticus about God not wanting teachers or pastors to have a blemish. Does this apply to one limb? Is this what it meant, the physical body? No, 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 no. It meant not a blemish in teaching truth. Okay. In other words, just as we read in a scripture today, God said, hey, I know what's going on down there. People robbing me, taking offerings, burnt offerings, which his love for false teaching. He said, I, I know that's going on and I won't put up with it. All right. Well, but if a person is doing right, and it sounds like your father was a good teacher, so, hey, no problem. His, and, and you know what? His spiritual body is perfect. He's got two arms. You said that studying with you is being in church, but where can I get my boys baptized? Any Christian can baptize another Christian, okay? Um, we do baptize here at the chapel, but you're in... Um, uh, Oregon, and you're a Christian, you can baptize those boys. They may not be able to join certain churches and they accept the baptism, but Christ will. Because the baptism is between the boys when they are at the age of accountability. That simply is a way of saying when they know what they're being baptized for. Okay. Not just mother's request, but the fact that they know they're being baptized because Jesus died on the cross. He went into the tomb, but he resurrected like going under the water, right out of it. And, and they do that publicly. That means before you or family, whoever is there. Larry from California. Mary Magdalena, Joanna, and Mary, mother of G James, were women that watched the crucifixion of Jesus and then followed Joseph of Arimathea to the tomb to help bury Jesus. Then they saw the Romans roll a boulder across the tomb's interest, entrance. Three days later, the women came to put to that sepulchre with spices they are, had prepared to anoint Christ's body. How did they expect to get into the tomb guarded by Roman soldiers and sealed by a large boulder? They, it was customary that you were able to anoint the body, and the Roman soldiers would have rolled the stone away. Or they were pretty hefty ladies. They could have rolled it away themselves, you know. It's the, the old Israelitish women, they went to war with their husbands sometimes even. They were can-do type people. But uh, they, it was a customary thing. And the Roman soldiers, had they been awake and asleep, if they hadn't already hightailed it out of there, they would have done it for them. But Almighty God himself saw to it that they had no problem. Jesus was gone. Pan from, um, Dan rather, from North Carolina. I understand that the Passover is the 15th day after the spring equinox, but how do you celebrate it? What, with, um, with gathering and teaching, but mostly what he became. Christ became our Passover. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. What did Christ leave us of his blood and of his body? is Holy Communion. So Holy Communion is the table of the Lord. And Passover is a very special communion because He is our Passover. Okay? What is the parable of the fig tree? The parable of the fig tree is, as it is written in uh, Jeremiah 24, is the good figs and the bad figs when they go back to Jerusalem and establish the nation Israel. Um, that's the generation of the fig tree. And in, Ezek in Matthew, I'm sorry, in Matthew 24, but also Mark 13, you are told that the generation of the fig tree will not pass away until all prophecy is fulfilled. We are that generation because in the year of our Lord, 1948, Israel will become a nation again. Both the good and the bad fig. Alfonso from Pennsylvania, I believe that you may have said that after Yahshua's Jesus Christ that it was the end of, the being any, of there being any prophets. Excuse me if I'm wrong in saying that you said this if you didn't. 
in Ephesians 4, 1, and 2, 1 through 12, it speaks about gifts and Jesus Christ um, giving gifts to people and being prophets. So if there's still prophets, isn't there still some who prophesy to this day? No. Okay. There will be sons and daughters who will prophesy when Christ walks the earth. Why do I say that? Because you have certain idiots in this nation that go around claiming to be prophets and misleading whole churches because they, they don't have the Word of God and they differ from the Word of God. Christ told us in Mark 13, a prophet is a teacher. And when one teaches the prophets, that is prophecy. And we have it. If you have a proper teacher that is teaching the prophets, why? Because Christ told us, you've got it. I have foretold you in Mark 13. I have foretold you all things. What? Through the prophets and the apostles. There isn't any more. You have to dig it out. But in the end times after the Antichrist walks on this earth, you will have people. But I, I'm... I, I'm like God. I hate people that rob him that are fakes, that are false, and say God said this and God said, I didn't send them. If you want to know, read just before God tells you he's against the rapture doctrine in Ezekiel chapter 13. He said, man, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls when my outreach saving arms are out there to help them. And you tell them to fly to save their soul. You don't have to read God's Word. You're going to be gone. The whole first part of that chapter 13 is very severe against false prophets. God doesn't like them. You know something? I don't either. I, I don't like people misleading God's children when He sent us the Word and the prophets and they need to be taught. But there will be prophets and prophesying between the sons and the daughters as it is written in Acts chapter 2 and which is that that was spoken of by Joel the prophet which is Joel chapter 2. Okay. Uh, Jane from Texas, um, thank you for enjoying the work. Uh, it says in Revelation a day's wage will be a pound of wheat, a loaf of bread. Is it sensible for us to stockpile food and supplies? If bread keeps going up, that's about what it's going to amount to with the price of corn and wheat going where it is. It, you know, even, uh, I don't want to say stockpile, stockpile, stockpile. The, the, the uh, tribulation for each person is only going to be 10 days, uh, five months max. And, and everybody, because of uh, truck strikes and everything else, everybody's pantry should have some food stocked in it, you know. My, my, I can remember when I was growing up, our cellar, we spent most of the summer canning foods and putting in that cellar. That was our, I mean, you either had it or you didn't, okay? And we, boy, did we eat good. You don't, you don't buy food like that anymore. Woo, that's, that was good eating. But everybody should have a pantry with uh, food in it because, just, just because. You might lose your job, be out of work a little, you know, beats going hungry. Yep. Uh, but, I, I, you know, God takes care of his own. Uh, Donald from Florida, please tell me how to, please tell me how the day that we remember the crucifixion and resurrection on of Jesus is determined. The day is not the year, you ask for the day. You take the spring equinox, which usually always falls on March the 21st. And, and uh, you count 14 days after this, the spring equinox. That starts the new year. That's the first month. Okay. And at the end of that 14th day at sundown begins the 15th. And the 15th is always the highest of Christian Sabbaths. I don't care what day of the week it falls on. And it's been that way since the beginning of time. It doesn't matter what day of the week is on uh, for the Passover to, or, or 
the fall fellowship to be, that's to say the Feast of Tabernacles, that's the high Sabbath. Okay. But uh, that 15th becomes that high Sabbath, and that's the day that we mark. Okay. James from Florida. In the Companion Bible, in chapter 24, verse 40, he doesn't give a book. Okay, let's see the question. Maybe I can, will know. Please explain whether you are to be taken or left. Companion Bible states that you want to be taken. Well, you're talking about Matthew 24. Okay, that's because uh, the, it says the same thing in Mark 13, but there's not 40 verses in Mark 13, and you say chapter 24. It's Matthew. I realized that... Uh, Dr. Bullinger passed away in 1915. He did not, though he was a fantastic scholar, he did not have the privilege of seeing all prophecy come to pass that we do in this generation. And quite frankly, many might say, well, why do you push the Bible so much when that one line is incorrect? Because I'm good enough a teacher, I know you'll spot it. You know? I, I'm not worried about my ability to teach because God gave it to me. So I know that my students will catch it. The work is still good. We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Okay, hey, I'm out of time. You know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. When you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours, okay? We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God, He will always bless you. But most important, tell you what, you stay in His Word. Hey, every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800 643 4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel. Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.